So it's two Tims talking philosophy. I'm Tim. No, I'm Timothy. <laughs> and I'm Tim. Timothy and Tim. Two Tims. Here we go. The topic for the day is God and morality. Does God have a place in moral theory? That's a very good question. I don't know. Here's one answer. There is a God and morality comes from God. What God commands is right. Anything that God forbids is wrong. And that's the whole story. Well, I'm not a big fan of the divine command theory uh, because there's a very classic problem with it. Now, I actually like the idea that what God commands is right and what he commands us not to do is wrong. I'm just not sure that could be the whole story. And there's this classic problem called the Euthyphro dilemma. This dilemma comes from the fact of questioning, well, wait, when God gives his commands, does he recognize what's good and bad? and then tell us, oh, don't do that because it's bad? Or is there no such thing as good and bad apart from his commands? And so it's just he sort of makes his commands arbitrarily. This, this is, is a, a dilemma, dilemma because if you say, well, wait, God recognizes what's good and bad, and then he bases his commands on that, then it doesn't seem like God's commands are needed, right? If there's already good and bad out there, his commands might sort of be informative, but they're not doing any work. They're not making anything right and wrong. Yeah, they, they would be informative in the sense that someone might say, well, they're useful. We can now look to the scriptures to find answers for right action and wrong action. But I can see how it kind of, uh, it guts the divine command theory of any real interesting content. Yeah, yeah it's, it's kind, kind of like, like how, how, you know, I might tell my kids, kids you shouldn't hit your sister. sister. That's mean. That's bad. And that might be the way they learn about morality, but it's not as though my saying it is what makes it wrong or what makes it bad. I'm just sort of recognizing morality and then, and then telling them. So... If God's just doing that, that's great. But that means morality isn't based on his commands. It would mean he's just recognizing what's already wrong and right and then making those commands. And it only gets worse from there because if God is all powerful and all good, and maybe we should have cleared that up in the very beginning, we're using God in a traditional sense of a very particular conception of God, sometimes called the classical theistic conception or maybe just more broadly, the God that people tend to think of if they're coming from the Western tradition, whatever the Western tradition is. All, all these things are controversial, but the God that you would find in Judaism, Islam, Christianity, for example, that God is supposed to be all powerful. But if morality is something outside of God, and I like how you put it, God's just reporting what's right and wrong. He's not creating it with his commands. Well, then that seems to be a threat to God's power because now even God has to obey morality or, or is somehow under the authority of morality that's outside of God. Yeah, I think you've identified something that is uh, attractive about divine command theory. If you already believe in God, then God is supposed to be in charge of everything, right? And if there's a standard outside of God, if God has to follow the rules, then it seems like there's something sort of above God. And so if you believe God exists, you probably want morality to be under his control. That seems like a good thing. And so if it's not, then it sort of calls into question his powerfulness, his, his omnipotence. So that's a reason you might be attracted to divine command theory. But I think what we were just talking about is, but if you like divine command theory, you still have to settle this question of if, if morality is not outside of God, if it's just his commands, why is he making the commands he does? Is it just for fun? Does he just wake up one morning and go, you know what, today I'm going to command people not to murder. That sounds fun. It, it's a nice little trap that Socrates has laid here. Did, did we mention, I can't remember. I don't think we it, mentioned It was Socrates, Socrates who came up with the Euthyphro dilemma. He's just copying me. Yeah. <laughs> right. Socrates has laid a nice trap here. If we say, no, God has reasons for what he commands, then those reasons are what make the action right or wrong, depending on what we're talking about. If, on the other hand, you say, oh, no, no, God just, God just commands it. Well, now we have God making stuff up on the fly, which is kind of what you laid out just now. Yeah, yeah my, my favorite example is, you know, what if God woke up one day and said, not that he sleeps, but if you woke up one day and said, you know what, um, morally speaking, it's wrong to um, quack like a duck on Tuesdays. Well, if that's what he chose to command, then all of a sudden that's part of morality. And that just seems kind of ridiculous. Like, well, he wouldn't command that. Well, why not, right? If, if morality is just his commands, what is he basing his commands on? Let's go back to the main question here. Let's see if we can clear things up a bit. 
The question is God and morality. And maybe we should rewind all the way back to the beginning of this podcast and start over and say, why would two philosophers teaching philosophy at a college campus, for example, why bring God into it at all? In other words, I can, I can imagine a student sitting in the back of the class kind of rolling their eyes and saying, oh, geez, I, I didn't know we were going to have a lot of God talk today. Well, one reason we might talk about God and morality in the first place is because historically, God has played a big role in this discussion. Um, so it's a commonplace belief. Whether or not you think it's the right belief, it's one that I think should be addressed. And not just historically, but worldwide right now. Yeah. Ask anyone off the street, globally, where does morality come from? They're probably going to say something about God. Yeah, and I think there's a really common idea where if, if you start to doubt whether God exists, you start to wonder whether there's any real objective value in the world because this idea of God is a kind of grounding idea for a lot of people. So I think it does make sense to talk about it, and I don't even necessarily think it's wrong. Um, I actually think God does play some role in morality, but it's worth reflecting and thinking about, well, what exactly is that role? Are we assuming there is a God? I mean, we're asking, what's the relationship between God and morality? Or are we saying, hypothetically, if there's a God, this might be the relationship to morality? Or is the question only of interest to people who believe in God in the first place? Well, I think it's, it should be of interest to everyone, who, people who believe in God or not, um, because part of the question is, must God exist in order for there to be morality? So if you think he doesn't exist, but you also think God is needed for there to be morality, then you've got a conclusion there. There is no morality. So it's still going to be important to you what role God plays in morality, whether or not you believe God exists. Now, I am approaching it from the position that I, I think God exists, but I also don't like divine command theory. And so I'm in a sort of weird situation where there's a really popular view about morality for people who believe in God, and I happen to not like that view. I see this all the time in the classroom. Uh, students who believe in God, who are convinced God must have something to do with morality, some sort of central connection that's important, and yet they see the power of the Euthyphro dilemma, and they, yeah, I can almost see them sweating in the back, you know, what do I do now? So I guess the move would, would be to go to natural law theory or something else. I tell all my students, whether we're talking about arguments for God's existence or the divine command theory, just because you think a particular theory doesn't work or a particular argument doesn't work, you don't have to sort of throw the whole view out. It, it doesn't mean God doesn't exist. It doesn't mean God has nothing to do with morality. It just means this particular view that someone has come up with doesn't look like it's going to work. So there are, there are other options, and natural law theory is one that I think is, uh, I think is more attractive for a person coming from a theistic point of view, a person who believes in God. Yeah, I'm working, I'm still working out for myself what the answers are to this question of God and morality. I'm not quite sure what to say when, whenever any, someone turns it back around on me and asks me what I think. I'm tempted to say, why not just be a Kantian? Or why not just be a virtue theorist or a utilitarian or, or many of these other theories that don't explicitly work God into the theory. We might just call these secular theories, so theories of morality that don't bring God at all. But couldn't someone believe in God, even be committed to God in some serious way, maybe a devoted Christian or a devoted Muslim, for example? Couldn't they just be a Kantian? Is there anything wrong with that? I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, there's going to be pros and cons to any sort of philosophical view you, t you take up. But I suspect anyone who's coming from a religious tradition, let's say Protestant, Christian, or uh, even Muslim or any J Judaism, any of those traditions, I don't think there's anything in those sacred texts that say, thou shalt be a divine command theorist. Oh, um, right, yeah, that's right? true. And so, so there's going to be, um, it's going to be an open question whether these views are compatible with a particular religion. But I suspect a lot of these moral views that don't specifically mention God will be able to fit with different religious traditions. It just might turn out that the role you think God plays in morality maybe isn't precisely what you thought it was. Um, right, yeah. But for example, you mentioned virtue theory. I happen to really like virtue theory. And I think a virtuous person is someone who's just excellent in every respect of living. And I think, wow, as someone who believes in God, I've got the paradigm example of virtue in God. Does that mean God created morality? I don't know what that would mean, but I think it's still relevant to talk about God 
but you can still keep that discussion separate from virtue theory on its own. Is it unfair to say that maybe some theories are not so compatible with belief in God? I don't want to start a bar fight here. Um, (laughs) Some utilitarians might aim a chair at me, but I I sometimes wonder if utilitarianism might be off the table for some religious traditions just because, well, I guess we'll have to save it for another podcast. But uh, would it be fair to say, and by the way, I don't know why I keep grilling you with questions. (laughs) You can turn it around on me, but what would you think of something like utilitarianism? Might that, might that stretch the commitments of some uh, religious believers just because, for instance, it is hard to balance justice in utilitarianism? Or am I just showing my anti-utilitarian colors? <laughs> I, uh, it's just your anti-utilitarian yeah, okay. colors, yeah, I think. I thought so. uh, no, I mean, I, I, I hear the point, and I think, I think there are some counterintuitive consequences of utilitarianism that we can talk about another time that that are difficult to swallow as a religious person. But I also think there is a lot of room to explore what may or may not be compatible with your religious faith. Because I've, I've come across philosophers who have tried to make the case that God is a utilitarian, mm, yeah, um, even from a specific you know, Christian religious tradition. So that doesn't mean they're right, but it means there's at least room to discuss whether or not that philosophical view fits with the religious view. I've had students suggest that in class without any prompting on my part at all. In fact, very often when I have this conversation in class, we'll do it for one week and then we'll move on and God doesn't really get mentioned again. But sometimes a student will mention weeks and weeks later when we're learning utilitarianism, you know, I wonder, maybe God's a utilitarian and God's commanding us to all maximize happiness all the time. Yeah, I mean, in fact, and this is, going to take us a little too far aside, so I'll just make a a short comment. The problem of evil is a big problem for religious believers, which is why does God allow suffering? And you might think, well, if God's a utilitarian, um, he allows suffering because it brings about in the long run, he has this grander plan where he's going to do greater good in the long run. That sounds very utilitarian, right? He's allowing some bad stuff to happen to bring about greater good. Now, whether or not that works is another question, but it's not totally unrealistic to think something like that might might fit with a religious tradition. Yeah, we're really getting in the weeds here, but it might even be, you know, to take it a step further, that if we deny God's being a utilitarian, now we just made the problem of evil worse because we don't have that easy reply of God allows evil for the greater good. Exactly. Anyway, time to move on, that, I suppose. <laughs> Earlier in a previous discussion, we talked about the motivational question, why be good or why care about the right thing? We talked about the epistemological question, how do we ever know what's right and what's wrong? And then the metaphysical metaphysical question, which is just a straightforward question of what makes something good or bad? What makes something right or wrong? I want to talk for a moment about the motivational question. Do you think religion overall is a force for motivational good? In other words, religions, right or wrong, Uh, motivate people to work hard, care for their families, look out for their neighbor, and so on? Or are the new atheists correct that really religion contaminates everything it touches and we would all be better off in an atheistic world where people rid themselves of this illusion? Any thoughts on that? I have lots of thoughts on that. (laughs) Um, One thing I'll say is it's easy to paint in broad strokes when we're talking about what religion does and doesn't do. And as philosophers like to point out, it's a little more complicated and nuanced than that. So do I think there are problems in religious traditions, especially with regard to what it motivates people to do? Uh, Absolutely. I think there are, for example, there are people who seem to be quite selfish and use their religious traditions for their own gain, whether it's they're only religious because they want to go to heaven and have eternal reward, or um, they use it to manipulate people or whatever. But I think in general, when we're talking about why should I be good, why should I care about what doing what's right? I think a lot of religious traditions offer good answers to those questions, very reasonable answers to those questions. For example, a commandment in the Christian Bible is love thy neighbor. And the the motivation for, for doing something loving and doing something caring doesn't appear to just be avoiding hell and getting eternal reward. It appears to be uh, intrinsically motivating that the the loving act itself is worth doing because it's good. Um, Hmm. That that seems like a good source of motivation. Uh, So I'm not sure that motivation is totally laid out in 
in any of these religious traditions, but I think there can be a lot of good motivation coming from these religious traditions. And I think you could give a parallel answer, and I don't mind saying I would give a parallel answer for the epistemological question. Overall, do religions make it more difficult to know what is right or wrong because they're mixing in all kinds of false teachings, someone might say, or do they shed some light? And I think the answer is real similar to what you just gave for the motivational question. There's some good and there's some bad. Every religion is, is a mixed bag of some true teaching and some false teaching. And we have to sort through it, just like everything in yeah. life, right? We have, to, we have to sort through the news. You have to sort through the books. You have to sort through people telling you this and telling you that. I think we're looking for a formula that'll give us all the correct answers, but it doesn't matter what source you look to. You're always gonna have to make a judgment of whether you can trust the source and what parts are correct and what parts are incorrect, isn't it? I think that's- something, something like that. I think that's exactly right. And as much as philosophers like to take a step back and critically reflect on what we've been handed, and I think that's the right approach, that doesn't mean what we come up with is automatically better than what others have come up with. And mainstream religious traditions for a very long time have had a lot to say about morality. And it would be pretty arrogant to just dismiss it outright without taking it into consideration and thinking, okay, what are they saying? Why are they saying it? And yeah, I think it's, it's foolish to disregard thousands of years of human history who have taken religious teachings to be a source of moral information and think that's somehow not relevant to this discussion. I think it's absolutely relevant and, and a way of knowing about morality. While also acknowledging that we can make improvements here or make improvements there as we learn new things or, or make corrections along the way. Yeah, absolutely. That d it doesn't mean they're infallible. Um, right, they can't no make way. mistakes. It's Although infallible. if you're if you're religious and you believe in God, you probably think God is infallible. Yeah, I just heard the fundamentalists <laughs> rising up there, right? <laughs> so I'm, the Bible yeah. is infallible, but maybe our interpretation isn't. But now we're really getting off the uh, off the track. But yeah, this yeah. is this is complicated stuff, isn't it? It is. It is. All right, here's something. If I understand Richard Swinburne's position, he says something like this: God creates the conditions or the context for what is right and wrong. So. We just happen to be carbon-based creatures and fire burns our skin and it hurts. It didn't have to be that way. If you believe in God, God created us and he made decisions about what we'll be made of and what will hurt and what won't and so on. So there's a lot of facts about the world that depend on God and how God created the world. He could have made fire soothing. So you can imagine a science fiction world where you know, the kid says, mom, come on over, bring some fire. I hurt my finger. This is getting a little silly, but the idea is just that, you know, the world could have been a different place. So don't set people on fire. Sounds like a pretty good moral principle for this world, but only because God set the world up in that way where we don't interact very well with fire. If God would have set the world up in a different way so that fire was soothing or, or provided a nice calming feeling, then the claim it's wrong to set people on fire would in fact be false. So I think I've kind of mixed myself up talking about this, but to get it out and to reach the conclusion, the idea is there are moral principles. Those moral principles are not created by God. They're outside of God, like we were discussing at the beginning. But how those principles interact with the world and what specific things are right or wrong depends on God's creation. So there is a sense in which God is closely related to morality. So for instance, it's wrong to set people on fire because God made us that way that it's very painful to be burned. I'm not sure what Swinburne's actual position is, but it sounds like you're describing something in the natural law ballpark, um, because you're talking about, well, it's not that morality is just what God commands, but look, we're made in a certain way, and there are just some things that are good for us and some things that are bad for us. And morality depends on what's good for us and bad for us, and God created us with certain things that are good for us and bad for us. And so he didn't make these arbitrary commands. He makes these commands based on how he made us and what he knows is good for us. Is, is that, that sort of like, like the picture you're painting? Yeah, I don't know what picture I'm trying to paint here, <laughs> but it's something like this. Maybe the laws of morality are like mathematics. They're just built into the world, necessarily so so that morality is necessary. So to get mm. technical, right? These are, these are necessary truths. They could not have uh, been otherwise. There's no possible world where murdering is morally okay because it's a necessary truth like two plus two equals four. 
And so if these necessary moral truths come built into the world, a lot like mathematics, then God didn't really have a lot to do with it as far as creating them or choosing them. It's wrong to set someone on fire. Why? Because it's necessarily true that it's wrong to unjustifiably cause pain in somebody. And fire, just by the way that God built the world, is something that causes pain. Ah, I see. I, I do think that would be a picture where if you have a, pic, if you have a God who is all-knowing, all-good, all-powerful, then he would be able to recognize, he would know what those moral laws are, whether or not he created them and would reasonably make commands that correspond with those. It's not clear whether they, it would be doing sort of metaphysical work, as it were. Um, it it would, wouldn't be changing what's right and what's wrong or, or determining what's right and what's wrong, but it seems like God would still play a role in that picture. But not much of a role, kind of a side player. So if yeah. you're looking for a God-centered moral theory, if you're a believer who, who just has this deep intuition that morality has got to do something with God and God has to be at the center of it somehow, then that very uh, light sketch that I just gave might not be the way that, that person wants to go because it doesn't seem like God is really at the center of that kind of theory. I think that's right. It doesn't, it, it in a way lowers God beneath morality and whether or not that, is an okay picture is going to depend on uh, on your religious tradition and your view of God and what you think is. is Look, I think people are too worried about this. I'll put my cards on the table. There's lots of things that God, if he exists, can't do. So you've probably heard these kinds of examples. God can't give an authentic signature of yours. He could perfectly imitate it, but it would be a forgery. He cannot give a genuine Tim signature. Just can't do it. Cannot create out of thin air a genuine American dollar bill. Why? Because part of the definition of a genuine dollar bill is that it be minted in a U.S. mint and so on. There's lots of these little cute kind of tricky examples, but some things God can't do. And I think most believers in God would be fine with saying that God can't lie. God can't deceive. God can't do lots of horrible things. And so I think most people who believe in God already accept various limitations on God. I put, I put limitations in quote marks here. Um, so why not say also that you know, there are some other limitations, but they're not really limitations. I, I'm not too worried about these limitations on God, so I'm probably closer to your view uh, that thinking morality, if it's quote-unquote outside of God, isn't necessarily a threat to God's goodness, to his power, to his um, you know, supremacy as the ultimate being of the universe. So I think you're right. There are if you already accept that there are some things God can't do, um, even just basic logical things he can't do, like make a square circle or make two plus two not equal four. Married bachelor. Yeah. I mean, so I'm not too worried about the fact that math is somehow above God, right? He can't break the laws of math. That doesn't seem troubling. So why, why should I worry too much that God can't break the moral law, um, that it's somehow above him? So I think there is something to that, that maybe people who are worried about morality being outside of God, if they, if they worry that's a problem, um, maybe thinking about these other limits on God that aren't problems helps us realize that maybe it's okay to have certain quote unquote limits. Yeah, well said. You won't find any disagreement from me. Maybe one thing we haven't touched on yet is this question of self-interest. On our previous discussion, you asked me, what do you say when someone says, why should I care about doing the right thing? Why should I care about being a good person? And I said that I kind of liked Aristotle's answer, that developing virtues and being a good person is beneficial. It's the way to go. Your life will flourish in that way. At least the chances of it flourishing are higher than if you go down the, the path of evil and the path of selfishness and the path of competition and ambition and everything else. So here's a question. If Aristotle gives the answer that you should be good and you should care about doing the right thing because it's in your self-interest, is there anything wrong with religions saying the same thing? Because very often religions will say, be a good person because you don't want to go to hell or uh, karma because what comes around goes around. Very often religions uh, take criticism on this. Oh, you're just turning morality into self-interest. But in the back of my mind, I'm often thinking, well, Aristotle thought that morality was about self-interest too. 
and we don't need to get into the details, but uh, social contract theory says, some, says something very similar. I, I probably worry more about the self-interest problem than, than you do based on what you were just describing, because I'm very much drawn to this picture that Aristotle paints of morality being good for us, um, not just as a society, but at, at the individual level, that somehow I'm living a healthier, fuller life if I'm doing the right thing, if I'm living a life of virtue and excellence. And so I like that picture, but I, I do worry that that picture, that fact that doing the right thing is good for us, I don't think that should be part of the motivation to do the right thing. Right, I mean, here's Kant coming up again. He's saying, you gotta do the right thing because it's the right thing, period. Yeah, I mean, I, I think about, you know, any, um, in my ethics class, I assign this clip from Friends, from the TV show Friends, where Joey and Phoebe are arguing about whether there's such a thing as an unselfish good deed. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a really interesting philosophical discussion. And one thing that gets brought up is, have you ever noticed that when you do something good, you feel good about it? Yeah. Um, and, and Joey's point was, that makes it selfish. And my thought is, well, if I do the good deed for the good feeling, then it seems like it was selfish. But if I do the good deed for some other reason, because I want to help someone and I recognize they need my help and it would be good to do that, I might go, it's gonna feel good. I'm gonna feel good about this, but that's not why I'm doing it. I think there's a difference between those two scenarios, doing it to get the good feeling and then just doing it, knowing I'm gonna feel good, but that's not why I did it. Yeah, we are complex creatures with complex motivations. I think very often we can do something with, with many, many different motivations. And I don't even think we're that good at unraveling what those motivations are. If you ask someone, why did you do that? I'm not sure that we have that's the true. insight to really to say why we do something. I think that's true. And it's, it is a little overly simplistic to say, oh, I did this not for the good feeling, but for these altruistic reasons. Mm -hmm. Uh, motivation is a, is a complex thing. And if anything, psychology has taught us uh, recently that we tend to come up with justification for why we do things. Post hoc reasoning. Post hoc reasoning. Yeah, the, Jonathan Haidt calls this the inner lawyer. So we already have our position in mind. And then only afterwards do we scramble to find explanations or rationalizations of why we've taken that position. Yeah, yeah. So beware that inner lawyer. <laughs> Okay, thanks Tim, it was a good discussion. Thank you. Thank you.